This is Siddhartha Alwalia. Welcome to the 100x Entrepreneur Podcast. This episode is brought to you by Prime Venture Partners, an early stage VC fund led by Amit Somani, Shripati Acharya and Sanjay Swami. Prime is often the first institutional investor in category creating tech startups in fintech, SaaS, healthcare and education such as MyGate, Quizzes, Mfine. To know more about Prime, visit primevp.in. Hi This is Siddharth Aluwalia. Welcome to the 100x Entrepreneur Podcast. Today I have with me Priya Mohan, venture partner at Venture Highway. Venture Highway is a early stage fund investing in seed to series A in Indian companies. Priya, welcome to the podcast. Thank you Siddharth. Very excited to be here. So Priya is an entrepreneur turned investor. She started her journey in venture capital in 2018 with Venture Highway, focusing on early stage tech investments. She sits on the boards of companies in social commerce, edtech, infratech, among others, and is extremely passionate about working with founders, especially in zero to one phase and one to ten phase. In 2012, uh, Priya co-founded Vidyartha, an ed- education technology platform for students in grades six to twelve, which she successfully exited to Byju's. We all know Byju's; it's the only edtech decacon in India. Priya would love to know about your journey you know much before venture capital about your work life you know how from ca you uh, you know you became an entrepreneur and then an investor uh, firstly sada thank you so much for having me in this platform uh, uh really appreciate it i think i my favorite way of introducing myself is to start by saying i'm from madras uh, people still call it chennai but i'm from madras uh, i think a uh, very middle class upbringing so as a typical madrasi you know my parents were very focused on getting me to be both culturally and academically oriented so uh you know the tick for dance the tick for music um and then of course uh, a lot of lot of academic um, you know kind of uh, focus as well i think it's that's when in grade 10 i realized that you know my interests were so diverse uh you know i was i was a performing dance user at that point of time uh i was very interested in journalism so i used to write for this very local uh, literally around the street kind of a uh, platform called adr times i used to like i literally beg their beat guy to write one story so i was just thinking that i could become a journalist and i was doing that and couple of other things i realized that you know while i was doing well academically that i didn't want to do anything in 11th and 12th which will sort of uh impinge on my ability to do multiple things so i actually took commerce much to the disappointment of my teachers and my principal and my parents as well and then i continued to perform and then ca happened purely because a my dad was a ca and b was you know having taken commerce which was pretty much a blasphemy uh you know doing something respectable and ca was probably considered a little more respectable i joined ca uh, uh, you know uh, i joined as an apprentice with uh, Fraser and Ross which was Deloitte in Chennai it was pretty rigorous great exposure but then very quickly i realized that i was not my personality didn't suit it because it was more kind of a post mortem especially the audit and even when i was auditing i was more interested in the internal audit which is like where i it, it gets me to be in the factories you know understanding how things were working rather than you know doing the statutory audit which was more ticking right the bank reconciliation and other things so cutting the story straight to you know how i finished my ca I, my first job was to break away from my uh, influencers which was my father and everybody was telling me that i should continue in deloitte i went straight to delhi found a completely completely uh, random job if you might call being the uh, executive assistant to the founder of apj group of hotels and one year i literally first six months i cried myself to see, sleep literally it was a cultural shock for me and then from there the journey started moved back to bangalore i was in ernst and young and then back to chennai and then uh went to isb in 2007 i passed out of isb and by then i i'd gotten married and chennai was constantly pulling me back uh because my husband is also a first time founder and he had a manufacturing outlet there so when back in chennai i kept coming back to chennai and i thought okay now what do i do i think i'm reasonably smart but this place is becoming a huge constraint so what do i do to kind of break away and that's when the whole genesis of a startup started it was literally to break away from the constraint of a location and then vidyartha happened because it was literally the story of my life 
right? Which was literally if I had somebody who have advi- who would have advised me better, who would have guided me better, to probably channel that energy, which I probably splintered across eight different directions, could I have been in a place better than this. So that was the genesis of Vidyartha, which was aimed at school students to give them better le- learning guidance. Uh, my co-founder was based out of Bangalore, so. I did first five years shuttling between Chennai and Bangalore. We built the business out of Bangalore. My daughter was two. So five a.m. Shatabdi and back Monday through Wednesday was for the first five years of my life. It was when I look back today, I feel tired. I don't know where I got the energy, but it just was exciting. And then, uh, you know, we were very fortunate uh, to have, uh, you know, secured the Baiju's deal. Uh, and we can talk about it a little later. But then Baiju's happened and then I moved to Bangalore with my daughter while my husband still continues to shuttle so this is this has been a journey till you know vidyasa and then very accidentally i met samir who's the founder of venture highway um and uh, you know uh, to correct you we don't have kind of uh, uh, names in venture highway we don't call ourselves partners so uh, we ju- i'm just called a startup sensei it, it just blew my mind when samir said i'm not going to give you titles it's because we really wanted to build a flat organization. But uh, Samir was looking for somebody to lead Bangalore and this common friend of ours introduced us and he said, okay, sh- uh, you know, Priya has been a founder before. Maybe you guys should try and see if this happens. And what started off as a six-month experiment, I just finished two years with Venture Highway and loving every minute of it. So uh, Priya, tell us about your Vidyarsa journey. Like, uh, you know, uh, what was the problem, you know, uh, solving through tech in, in Vidyarsa? And uh, to what scale you grew in, you know, let's say uh, yearly revenues and number of paid subscribers or students you had and uh, how big was the exit? Um, so let me start with uh, the problem statement. I think I'm going to cut to the pivot because there was a there was a little bit of the first year was more on the discovery. Essentially, our problem statement was today parents and students were buying a lot of products and services. But very often, these products and services that they were buying were instant purchases, which were determined by, oh, my child is doing so badly in math, so I'm going to put her on a math tuition, or I'm going to get a Kumon, or I'm going to get a Baiju's. And you would have heard most of them, you know, not really thinking about the long-term impact of buying those products and services. So our idea was, can we, we had a diagnostic platform, which was pretty powerful, uh, where, you know, we uh, identified uh, the learning, uh, you know, uh, the learning uh, path of a kid under four different quadrants, which included interest, aptitude, personality, and academics, and built, kept building algorithms, which were very, very specific and very tied into our boards, which is CBSE, ICSE. We did very few international schools, but we did a majority of CBSE, ICSE. And we started figuring out in the long term, where is this child likely to go? What are the subjects he or she is likely to follow and where is this you know where are the gaps from an aptitude and academics perspective uh to give you an example a child very often in their eighth grade or sixth grade would say six to eighth grade would say they love you know to do something completely they'll say geologists they'll say anthropologists and all of those by the time the same kid comes to grade ninth and tenth you will see a complete polarization kids are almost often conditioned to just pick science or pure science which is biology physics chemistry or you know or just, uh, you know, math and computer science, or the third, you know, uh, which is commerce. And that's all they knew. And and it was amazing for me as to how kids with so much diverse interest, suddenly when it comes to just 10th and 11th, it becomes so polarized. And when you actually break that down, you will realize that kids who are constantly been spending time on math tuitions and English tuitions, the gap between the academic performance and the aptitude one way or the other So very often you will see kids still getting 85, 90 in English and maths because we are such rote learners. When you actually ask them basic problem solving, critical thinking or comprehension, they would be in the 30 percentile, 40 percentile. And these were we were creating these leaderboards, benchmarking kids across a region, across a state nationally as well. So every dashboard had where the kids stood within their locality, within their school, within the region, within the within the country. And then based on these gaps, the idea was, can we then curate products and services which are truly relevant to the kids from their long-term perspective? So if this kid is going to take 10th grade PCMB, then post-PCMB in their 12th, what are their 
uh, likely undergraduate postgraduate courses so hence what products do they need today what products do they need today to do well then and maximize their outcome so literally we had mapped thousands of courses mapped the entire undergraduate postgraduate mapping in india and gave those full learning paths and the idea was can we build a commerce layer over it which is curate products and services that was the idea and uh, to give you a uh, you know to the extent that i can disclose because i had very strict ndas but uh, we were uh, at the time of selling to byju's i we had worked with the cbse we did a massive launch with cbse we powered their entire uh, career assessment for, uh, and and uh, aptitude assessment portal for grade 10 uh, was a massive massive launch and overall we managed to work with about 3500 plus schools <clears throat> by the time we sold and across india and the middle east and post Uh, selling to byju's the idea there was given that we are a b2b to c while byju's is a b2c is there a way that our product becomes a precursor to curate byju's products better for kids which means identify their learning needs and gaps better so that byju's can deliver their products and services better um through that journey we uh, both my co-founder and i we uh, you know completely focused on tier 2 regions and did the b2b to c selling for them and there again about 19 plus regions and we were doing an average about 200 250 schools literally a week uh after our sale so that was the uh, long and short of vidyasa and where it went post the acquisition so priya post the acquisition how did you get the clarity that you want to do be a vc um well so that i didn't get that clarity actually the the better clarity was that i wanted to take a break and <laughs> that was my and the common joke was every time i meet a founder i say this right and it's genuinely the situation is when a founder sells and you know everybody sees the outcome i think overwhelmingly one should also realize that it's a venture is a very very uh, low probability game right and the kind of very often it's also being at the right place at the right time so that kind of gives you that gratitude that you know you've been lucky enough for the outcome to happen all things being equal of course every one of us works hard and we have this goal in life and for the longest time the joke would be you know hdfc would send me a message saying minimum balance gone beyond 10, below 10000 <laughs> and for the first time I, you know and you should remember that both my husband and i were first generation founders right so we had an emi i had a 3 year old and <laughs> we were both running businesses so there was no salary coming in today when i look back i was like how foolish we have been but from there to this the first thing i wanted to just sit back right just put down my shoulders and you know probably take a break then i realized you know i'm not built that way so while i'm taking a break you know i want to start thinking about what i want to do next but i thought it's best to definitely take a six month break let's travel and then think and then in between i met samir and i loved the way they had built both neeraj and samir i spent time with both of them and i really liked their philosophy because the first line they said both of them said that look we started venture highway for our passion and i think that really res- resonated with me and i said okay let's do this right like and they're obviously reposing faith in me given that i'm 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 a founder i don't have a vc background and if you notice in india at least a significant number of them they've been at this job for a long time right especially when you're recruiting somebody at a leadership team it takes a hell of a faith for that to happen so i said look i really like to work with them and you know they come from a global uh, you know both of them ex googlers and uh, neeraj of course is iconic with his whatsapp exit it would be great to learn and work with them and then i said okay let's and i kept joking with samir i said look work with me and if you like my working style at best when i start something please write your first check with me and he kept saying absolutely and then you know i think i've been tricked to be here for 2 years and i'm completely loving it so it was completely accidental uh accidental plus the fact that i didn't have the next big idea at that point of time and i also wanted to gain a skill which till now i've been always uh, you know working in uh, from an very indian companies right like having you know spending a lot of time in madras there's only so much that you get from an exposure in terms of working with global companies and i think that also really attracted 
me and the fact that you know you get paid to learn vicariously from meeting founders right that's amazing um so very accidental uh and uh, uh, probably again a, a big big stroke of luck for me and what are the companies where you have led investment at venture highway um quite a few but i'd like to highlight i mean edtech after a long time uh, took a bet on this company called swiftlearn uh very very excited swiftlearn is a you know i'm a mother of a 12 year old today uh and uh, you know she's moved from an icse school to a uh, to a ib now but i i've been very close to the edtech uh, scenario not just as a founder but also being a mother and the uh, swiftlearn tries to solve for trying to be the best after school supplementary brand for online tuitions right and if you think about it you know today if you want to send your kid to a kumon right why would you send your kid to kumon because you're not worried about the teachers people who send their kids to kumon they like the framework they like the pedagogy there's a certain roi you're getting what happens today is tuitions are largely still fragmented right most of the middle school parents send their kids to a tuition which is nothing but the teachers themselves in the school and the kids are huddled up in their houses and they're practicing the same thing that is taught in school right but there's a huge learning gap there and you know in vidyartha i had this massive data uh, state by state to show how there's a huge gap between aptitude and academics because kids are taught to score right but they're not taught to learn but scoring is equally important so the idea of swift learn is can we create a pedagogy driven framework driven brand which can uh, uh, you know scale the one is to few online tuitions uh founders abhinav abhinav um, ran dormant before which didn't work out but uh, really excited about his first principles thinking so that's one company uh the other uh, there's another edtech company which we are you know we are looking at um and then a uh, few other companies i work closely with which is uh, which includes uh w mall uh which is in the social commerce space uh again very very good founders uh we sit uh, along with saf and uh, chirate uh another company called build supply which is uh, in delhi uh work with uh, samir nair very closely build supply is in the infra tech space uh basically what they do is <clears throat> they provide saas for real estate and infra companies for their workflow management and on top of that they're building up procurement commerce very tech led tech first kind of a solution for this uh, space which has not seen much technology before and sam uh, amazing founder again uh, you know solid experience uh, have been in the real estate leadership positions for you know decades uh, so these are a flavor of some of the companies very very different very very different styles of uh, leadership teams very different spaces uh, and and it's been a great learning experience working with some of these companies and uh, on your linkedin you also write you know board member in mars play and and any other companies where where you hold a board position at so you know um a lot of these companies we you know uh we have board positions but we choose to take it at an appropriate time so we don't necessarily exercise the board position uh mars play again is a community cont- so mars play the thesis is, is run by uh, founder misba misba is you know pretty uh uh a uh, 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 quite a <clears throat> uh talk uh, i mean he he's quite popular in twitter he he's very connected in the startup community and misbah's thesis in mass play was about can we make content shoppable right and he focused on building this community of tier 2 tier 3 young people uh where the platform becomes uh very interesting for creators to again you know sort of allow their content to become shoppable uh so that's uh mass play they are young they just uh you know uh they've been around for about a year year and a few months uh again very very different uh styles of leadership and very different space so so would like to know you know you both you are and sami are in the leadership positions and you call your uh you know title is startup sensei what's what's been decision making like at venture highway uh, and you now are connected to other vc firms also how are you guys different we come from an operating background right uh, so neeraj obviously has has uh, you know been very closely associated with whatsapp and has been the cxo and then um, samir 
while he was at Google, of course, he's done that corporate M&A and everything. But he came back and seven years he was managing his family business. Uh, you know, literally, he says he uh, his joke would be, you know, I let go of Google's free food to come in, you know, be in the factories of Faridabad. And I, of course, I have not had their global exposure. I've been eternally, uh, you know, uh, uh, throughout been working in India and Indian companies. Right. And I've the last seven years of my own. I think that's the first thing. All of us are operators. I think the decision making, I would say, is one of complete collaboration. Having said that, it's also not what I like about Venture Highway is that um, each of us literally take conviction bets. And, you know, even if the other person and that's that's where I feel you find these amazing companies, right? If there's too much consensus, right? I don't know if uh, too much consensus. It, I mean, again, so that I'm talking about with two years experience in VC. So you have you may want to take my entire uh, gyan with a pinch of salt, but I feel some of these bets need to be on a conviction basis. And in, more often than not, one person is more convinced than the other, right? Um, so definitely not a parliament, which I love about Venture Highway. Literally, we are the fastest in decision making. We get together, uh, you know, Samir, Neeraj and I, generally it's over multiple calls, uh, sometimes two, three calls. And, you know, uh, you know, the one person presents the deal. Uh, you know, the other two may have some devil's advocate questions, but it, fundamentally it's a trust in the other person's decision making ability. And if we feel that one of us have that conviction, uh, then, you know, they we should do the deal. And I have personally experienced that because it's amazing to have been able to take decisions in this industry. Uh, uh, and I've heard these stories from others, right? How there's a process and everything. And personally, I've had the best experience of having to be able to take such conviction bets and having to be in, uh, having to be able to reflect on some of these decisions. Because uh, essentially, this game, I've realized, is only the quality of decision making. You can't control the outcome, right? There's so many variables. There are so many things. You know, and there are more often than not, you have so many companies where, you know, we always have this conversation. They have great metrics. Why haven't they be, been able to raise money? There's so many different dynamics that it's very hard to kind of model it out. At best, we can improve the quality of our decision making, improve our frameworks when we think of the founders and the spaces. I think for that, you should have the opportunity to learn from failures. And that comes only when you are able to completely own your decision execute on it, see the full cycle and actually face those failures to go back and revisit the quality of your decision and improve your framework. And I think that's that opportunity I've got amazingly in Venture Highway as a platform. I think in Venture Capital, there, there are two most important things, the quality of your deal flow and the second, which you mentioned, uh, you know, the quality of your decisions and decision making uh, is built over a period of time, right? We, we all come with subjective biases and we try to make them objective uh, as we keep on learning from our mistakes. No, you're absolutely right. I think the biggest bias, uh, to be very frank with you, is confirmation bias, right? Like, uh, you know, the minute you think you like something about a deal, you're searching and seeking for information which is going to just agree upon the decision which you perhaps have already made in your mind, right? Um, and then you, you know, kind of it keeps building on it. But... <clears throat> It's important to understand that, you know, what is interesting about this is you can at best create frameworks, but when you apply them, it's applied on such heterogeneous uh, data points, right? You will never find two founders who are the same. You will never find similar profiles. You'll never find similar combinations. You'll never find, you know, a certain equation that happens, which is the same founder profile plus the space plus something else. Your ability to apply these frameworks in this completely heterogeneous data points is what I think is is building the skill here, right? And to not be negatively biased, as much as we talk about confirmation bias, to also not be negatively biased because, you know, obviously for many of us, you know, there are spaces, right? As you know, edtech was like a crazy, very, not a great space before Baiju's, right? The whole funding happened, right? It was, you know, I remember one investor when I was, going to pitch who told me, oh, it's a graveyard of failures. And you know how that has changed today. So it's also important not to be negatively biased based on perhaps some decisions we took uh, on the sector or 
uh, this space. Absolutely, and 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 these things change over a period of time. Yesterday, uh, nobody used to care about edtech before Baiju and Academy and Topper. Today, every investor is looking to have a, a deep edtech portfolio. So, so things have things change in this industry pretty pretty much. You know, sometimes overnight also, as in case of COVID and demonetization. Absolutely, absolutely. You 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 come from a very different background. How has you know that helped you, or how has what are the pros and cons? I would ask of of having that. Um, lots of. Uh, let me start with the cons first. I think yeah. the first six months, you come with this optimism of a founder, right? Like most founders have this irrational optimism. That's what makes them founders. Yeah. And I I remember coming to work and I have I would have five to six meetings with founders five uh, meet five to six founders literally every week if not more. Yeah. And you know the I would love it right oh my god so many different ideas, and that kind of optimism was like looking at every deal, and thinking about how I would do this right. And I learned very quickly that's that's a very wrong and stupid way of looking at things because. and the best analogy i can give you for this is if you think you're a good uh, jockey great but don't think me- being a good jockey is going to automatically make you great at horse picking right those are two different skills and that's something i learned very quickly so i went through this journey of over optimism that i went through this entire cycle of cynicism uh, where i was trying to figure out what is the issue with every deal and then you get this balance right you start building your own style of mental frameworks your own you know kind of things that work for you right your own checks and balances and then you start looking at founders and companies in that eye um so i think the con is also the fact that uh for me initially to be able to understand and uh, uh internalize the fact that vcs are a second order uh, kind of a, a stakeholder in the business the guy who's running the business is the founder he's holding the saddle and he's going to sit on the saddle and he's going to ride it so to sink although it's theoretically understood to sink in took a while for me but over a period of time i think i'm learning how to make that a pro where i get excited to work with founders on small areas where they think they can bounce off their thoughts or they can bounce off their ideas with me uh and where that hat as a founder even though i'm sitting on their board in a complete non judgmental way because i've been on the other side and i understand the vulnerability the other thing i think and you know of course people claim this is gender specific i think I am very happy to show people my vulnerability and I think being authentic really helps improve the conversation. I'm very very particular for example regardless of whether the founder is being funded or not. When he comes to our office and when he sits across the table he has taken this decision of going to spend the next 10 years of his life on this idea. So can I make that conversation important for him? can i make that one hour fruitful for him right and i try uh to think of him as my customer and think of how i can give him the best one hour mm, that that's phenomenal so 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 you have uh, obviously made your one of the cons into pro <laughs> you know i mean having said that uh it's it's a fine balance that i think i think uh, at the end of the day it, it it when you're working with each founder the needs the way you work with them changes contextually and uh, i think that's a something is also i mean as i sit along as i sit on the boards and see the journey of some of these guys i think that that's a very valuable uh, amount of vicarious learning which can be channeled to your future founders as well and i think that's the experience that some of the long time vcs really have up their sleeves which is just the experience and the wisdom of having seen companies uh grow grow bigger fall i think that's amazing wisdom right and experience and if you're able to cleverly tactfully and contextually channel it 
uh, back to your young founders i think that's that's a responsibility i would say of a vc and and what would you would say you know the pros are being an outsider and an entrepreneur for a long time coming into vc i think the biggest uh, <laughs> i think you should do another podcast and ask about this to samir and neeraj but uh, i think i almost always have a very different perspective uh and it brings a very different flavor to the conversation um i think that's on account of two things i think one is uh one is obviously being having been a founder the other thing also i think women generally i feel and i have a lot of friends who are leadership uh, in leadership positions uh who are women and they bring a genuinely a different perspective right um i think that's that's another pro and i think the other thing is i've been very fortunate to work with very senior people in the industry and i uh in in a very short time to be given that year and being taken seriously despite my lack of experience in it right and that Uh, to be able to sit across the boards with people who've been probably doing this for years and founders who perhaps respect the the advice or the pointers that i give them i think that's been a that's been a phenomenal journey because when that happens faster and i've heard that different experiences for different people but at least personally for me i've i've been very fortunate in partnering with amazing people venture also gives you access that nobody else gets I don't think any and 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 that's a privilege and that's a privilege we should humbly uh uh you know sort of embrace and you know uh, uh acknowledge because venture gives you access like nobody else gives and that access if channeled in the right way can help you build you know your core uh, uh set of people who can help you think mentor you and you know drive your uh, intellectual uh, thoughts even better and that's one of the biggest pros i found and if you're able to channel that back to your portfolio to your companies that's amazing i think that's something this industry has uh which is a complete privilege because i'll tell you honestly today i mean as a first time founder right to be able to write a cold mail to somebody vis-a-vis today as a vc even if i write a cold mail right my probability of getting a response is far higher right 10x higher 10x <laughs> higher say. right and that's a realization i got when i joined and i'm like wow that is huge the access this place gives you is huge and i how do i responsibly give back with this access is what plays in my head all the time no with as, as the spider man quote goes it with huge power comes huge responsibility also you know every every vc almost represents the entire vc industry a poor experience with a vc shapes the mind of a founder absolutely absolutely but i you know i every time i have a conversation with a founder and when people come and tell me you know i've had this experience i've had that experience yeah i think if people like i don't know like you quoted spider man i would quote ugwe from my favorite kung fu panda right uh when when shifu comes and tells him i've got bad news Ugwe turns around and says there's no news i mean there's no good or bad news there's just news so like that if we take just apply the word feedback right and not worry about good or bad and i'm not saying it from the high horse of sitting as a vc i did that personally as a founder because trust me i've had absolutely 100x more rejections uh trying to raise money for an edtech company in the worst of the times for edtech no that, that really shapes your experience now as a vc i would say now you would think back that uh, you know that's been an advantage because you face being a founder that now now you know being a vc you bring a very different experience rather than a, a, a vc or a traditional vc or i would say a vc who has sold his company at the peak very successfully had all ducks lined up right i, I can very much relate it to myself yeah Yeah absolutely and I think I think what I tell people is that look instead of instead of um uh, looking at it from an emotional angle because at the end of the day see it, it when we look at it and the shaping the experience you're channeling everything to a person right instead of taking the uh, take the person away and just take his points and if, even if there is 10% uh feedback in there which is worth for any of us to reflect 
right i think that's worth reflecting on uh it's a good it's a good mindset to have especially as a founder because we have to be trained to hearing no all the time and the sooner you create a mental framework to sort of tackle that i think it's better for you to build an emotional resilience which is much needed being a founder no no you you pointed out rightly right the more a founder is able to associate the no for, from the person he is to what he is building and <clears throat> just a temporary feedback the, the better he is able to to take it uh, objectively or i say less emotionally because ev- every ev- every no adds a uh, emotional burden being a founder myself uh, you know this is the same thing which i do you know every every no to, uh, is a, is like a needle uh, in your confidence basically like absolutely in- absolutely and you know i have to tell you this the biggest challenge being a founder is to be able to live without the typical validations that you get being employed right see you're reasonably smart you probably have done something reasonable in your life and you start this with great passion and you know for the first 6 7 months you're exposing yourself to customers who are going to be brutal right and you're going to be getting feedback from there then you're exposing yourself to investors and not every meeting is going to be amazing where everybody is going to pat in your back and say wow i'm going to write a check right away and to be able to come back home and still hold that confidence right is something that i completely empathize and understand uh with founders right and i've gone through that as well right like uh, yes i'm a ca i went to isb you know i left a job doing this and there are days when you know i i would ask whether this is worth it and not to get philosophical about it the way i looked at it is you know at the end of it okay if there is a reason he's not writing a check what is it in my model and i would try and separate it out into two parts is the feedback very specific to the industry which i cannot control then there's nothing i can do or is the feedback very specific to my business model and then is the feedback is specific to my business model then i dive deep to see okay is there even a iota of merit in what that person is saying have i missed clues or have i missed some data points within my customer feedback to say that that's something that i should look at and if the answer is yes absolutely go back and iterate and that's how we pivoted right um i think that's a very important exercise that learning agility for founders is very very important and it's much easier to do it when you disassociate every conversation from the emotion and the person to the feedback no priya you know what what uh, you have said and what we have discussed is i wish somebody had told me when i was a founder myself this is val- applicable and valuable for all the founders out there because essentially in a 5 to 10 year uh, journey is is how you react to knows that you have to optimize right absolutely and i think even from a character perspective you look at my like linkedin there's a quote which says character over talent all the any time right if you you know like you said and you made a great point it's great life you ride out the wave if you're lucky enough to be, be on the top of the wave you're surfing high and high but some point when the wave hits and you have to get low i think that's when your character gets really judged and it's important to kind of build that up front and have some rubrics for it it really helps and one thing that has helped me personally is to i still continue to have some set of close friends and regardless of where i am or what i do i still my closest friends are still my ex co-founder or some founder friends who still tell me as it is and you need good people will tell you as it is right and i think that also really helps Th- thank you so much priya you know for for the candid conversation and sharing your experiences very candidly as being a founder and now uh of 2 years into a vc you know i i, I think uh, this conversation will help a lot of founders you know build up their confidence when they're feeling low or getting rejected from a vc because you know it's not not them it's it's an objective and vcs also make mistakes <laughs> from oh, time absolutely. to time absolutely <laughs> oh absolutely right like but see that's it's also important for founders to understand the business model of a vc right um 
like they have a business model the vcs have a business model and at the end of the day it's human beings who are making the decisions just like the founder has made a decision that he is going to go behind this space and he believes that this space is going to be large in a similar manner a vc is making a decision whether this founder and this space is going to be large enough so actually very often we miss that right the vcs are humans they are people making judgment calls and the very name judgment means it's a probability exercise it is not a definitive exercise right the entire vc spectrum whether it's the startup or the vcs it's a probability game and obviously when a a, a thing has fallen in the other side of the probability it's a loss right and that's the game we are playing and we have to just internalize that so even founders they should understand take all data points but don't give 1000% weightage to any data point right ray dalio says this beautifully i don't know i would recommend people to read this book called principles he says when you're evaluating data points please assign weightage to each data point and assign a believability index according to him also assign a weight depending on who that advice is coming from and look at the background and the experience of the person now obviously if the person is negatively biased he will have a certain data point if he is positively biased he will have a certain data point that's why i said take the feedback try and uh, you know extract the feedback which is very relevant to you and i think that will make a huge impact but you're right i think vcs make mistakes and i think the only answer to it is because it's a probability game right subhi as we are speaking you know the regret is much more higher on the the side of the vcs because as gorav munjal on an academy pitched to 15 investors while they were raising their seed to series a and only two or three of them said yes the rest 47 are feeling so bad about that decision because they either couldn't understand the space the time or the vision of the founder back then right similarly for for byjus there are only few people which a few vcs which said yes to byjus back in from 2011 to 2014 15 you know and we can imagine you know the the, the rest of yeah. them 50 to 100 vcs who said no what they must be feeling yeah. so, so so as you said you know founders should take vcs feedback uh, very very objectively and not assign too much weightage on it in the course of their journey yes i think you know i'd like to make a point about this regret yeah every big decacorn unicorn today is a regret for the vcs who are not in it right and if you've seen some of the best journeys this comes back to the original point uh which i made in in answer to your question as to how's the decision making adventure highway if you've seen every one of these complete breakout companies have been based on conviction calls i personally believe if things were so easy to see right then how do you get that uh big time outcome right it has to be an insight and i i bet uh you know uh when sequoia perhaps invested in baiju and then i've met baiju obviously multiple times even before he invested in us he's a special founder right he, the 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 way he talks about his story the way he presents his vision the passion and the energy he brings it's but obvious that somebody will relate to him of course at that point of time i think a lot of people would have said no because of the whole edtech debacle that happened and you know people were obviously worried about the space in the segment so ultimately it takes two people to connect if you think about it right you make a meeting and i i feel that with some founders right there is a connect there is an insight you connect on there is a founder you connect on right and you look at this guy and you say okay forget about five other things you think he's going to build a large outcome i think I have not met Gaurav Munjal from but what I hear about him from multiple people is that he comes across as that special founder. Um I think ultimately very very early stage investments is all about the founder, right? And it's about like I said two people when they are meeting there's a connect there's a connect either at a personal level at an insight level and then your belief that this guy is going to go and build or this girl is going to go and build something big. agree agree with you priya completely you know there there are not many data points that's why it brings all the risk in venture investing because you you have to be backing a founder without any data 
or you know which which gets created over a piece of time absolutely it's it's at that stage right especially at the stage that venture highway comes from we literally overdial on the founder and the founding team right and we have some frameworks in our head as to how uh you know about the whole founding team how to think about it and essentially it's i'm very comfortable with pivots i am i've pivoted so i personally will not believe uh you know anybody uh will come come can can reasonably come and tell you i got, i mean perhaps a very very small percentage that they've got the business model right and from day go right we are iterating all the time see at the end of the day you need a guy who has that emotional a uh, strength and the learning agility to be able to navigate the uh, uh, you know the cus- the markets and to be able to deliver and you have to trust him to pivot right and that's happened with couple of our other portfolio companies so ultimately we strongly believe that we need to overdial on the founder and the founding team of course the space is important if you don't relate to the space or we don't understand the space then uh, you know it becomes hard to take a bet but i think the weightage of the founding team and the founder is at a very very early stage is far far higher than uh, i would say even the business completely agree with you priya and thank you so much priya you know for sharing your insights today on 100x entrepreneur podcast it, it was lovely to have you uh, thank you so much for having me i think uh, really enjoyed having this conversation it's very not very often that you know you can have a free flowing casual um you know personal come professional conversation i really thank you for this opportunity